is uh, dedicated to, to dark matter experiments. And so uh, the first is Ran, who's going to, to, talk, to tell us about Xenon, the world leader yeah. in uh, the high mass regime. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. My name is Rani Tai from the Weizmann Institute of Science, a member of the Xenon collaboration. And uh, we're gon I'm going to talk today about the first results, the results from a 10 year dark matter search with Xenon. So ever since the 1930, when Fritz Wicke first coined the term dark matter, a large body of evidence has been accumulated, suggesting that there is more matter in the universe than what we can see. This evidence comes in various scales, from single galaxies to clusters of galaxies, and even in cosmological scales. And we believe now that roughly 27%, this is from Planck uh, collaboration, roughly 27% of the matter energy uh, <coughs> content of the universe is in this form of dark matter. The problem is that we don't know what is the nature of this dark matter. Now this is a nice plot taken from, uh, from uh, NASA ads. We have quite a lot of models and candidates for uh, dark matter particles. So this is the mass range in EV, so it spans from 10 to the minus 20 EV to 10 to the 70 EV. <coughs> and the height of each column corresponds to the number of citation in NASA ads. So as you can see, the most favorable one and the most quoted one is the WIMP, the weakly interacting massive particle, and this is the main focus of uh, this search that we have done. So the typical assumptions are that uh, dark matter, that our galaxy is embedded in a halo of dark matter with a density distribution that follows like 1 over r square. The local uh, density is 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube. <coughs> the velocity distribution follows a Maxwellian-Boltzmann distribution with a cutoff at V escape, with average velocity of 230 kilometers per second. Now once you assume this typical assumption, you immediately get that for a WIMP interaction, the interaction rate is very, very small, at the orders of one event per ton per year, in a xenon detector. Not, not much more than that. The second thing you get is that the recoil energy is very, very small, at the orders of 10 to 100 keV, maybe a little bit less than 10 keV. So a prerequisite from a detector is that you have to have the detector to be as large as possible, to have a bigger exposure, and you have to have ultra-low background in order to distinguish these few events per ton here from your background. The xenon, the, the xenon collaboration consists of um, 165 scientists from uh, 25 institutions, 11 countries all around the world except for Latin America. We have conquered recently uh, Asia as well. Um, <coughs> operating our, detect our detectors at the Laboratory Nacional de Gran Sasso in Italy, exactly here in the center of Italy. This is below 1500 meters of rock of the Gran Sasso mountain. This is the entrance for the highway below the, the mountain. And in the middle of the highway, you get this, I really like this picture, this is kind of get getting into the bat cave. Uh, <laughs> so you get into the bat cave there, and this is the, the, the laboratory itself. So the timeline for the experiment has started at uh, 2005, with xenon 10, consisting of 25 kilograms of uh, xenon in the detector. Moved to xenon 100 between 2008 and 2016, with 161 kilograms of uh, xenon, improving the sensitivity or the exclusion limit by uh, roughly two orders of magnitude. The current phase is xenon one ton, opera well operating 2018, but started the commissioning by 2012, consisting of 3.2 tons of uh, xenon. Again, improving the sensitivity by roughly two orders of magnitude. The exclusion limit for 50 GeV is a bit higher, but uh, for 30 GeV we get a lower uh, exclusion limit. And the next stage, which we are currently already working on, is xenon anton, where n equals 8, and uh, is projected to give results by 2023, and projected to improve the sensitivity by another, two or by another uh <coughs> order of magnitude or so. So it's not, it's not enough only to make your detector bigger and bigger, because you have intrinsic background, so you need to also make your background lower and lower. So this is a nice uh, <coughs> plot to, to see how the improvement in the field. So we started with Xenon 10, which had roughly 1,000 low ER, ER energy recoil background events per ton per kV per day. Moved along the line and now at, <coughs> at Xenon 1 ton, so these are other experiments based on uh, liquid Xenon, LAX and Panda X. And in Xenon 1 ton, we see that for uh, 1.3 tons of uh, fiducial volume, we get 
0.2 ER background events per ton per kV per day. So this is a big improvement in the field which allows us to increase the sensitivity much and much. So this is the numbers in the fiducial volume, yeah. But this is, yeah, this is the also the background in the fiducial volume. So this is, this is what enters your uh, analysis at the end. So we are, we are, I, I will show this, I will show the backgrounds in the experiment. It's not only the fiducialization. We, we are no longer at the point where we choose our fiducial volume. I'm, I'm jumping a bit ahead, but I'll go to this. But we are no longer at the stage when we are choosing our fiducial volume to have zero background events. We're choosing it, we are choosing it to be as big as possible in places that we can actually quantify our background because we're doing a profile likelihood analysis and not a counting experiment anymore. I'll reach to that, okay? Right, so all of these uh, uh, detectors, they are all dual-phase ti dual time projection chambers, so it means we have gas xenon at the top, liquid xenon at the bottom, and when a particle interacts with the liquid xenon, it deposits energy. This energy goes to a prompt scintillation, which is detected by the PMT arrays on the top and on the bottom, and this prompt scintillation is what we call S1. It also goes to ionized electron, which are drifted above by the applied electric field and produce a proportional secondary scintillation in the gas phase, which we call S2. Now, by the heat pattern on the top PMT array of the S2, we can determine the X, Y position of the interaction. And by the time difference between S1 and S2, we can uh, reconstruct the depth of the interactions, allowing us a full three-dimensional position reconstruction, which allows us to take events only from the center of the detector where we have lower background, from a volume which we call a fiducialized volume. A second uh, uh <coughs> effect that these S2 and S1 have is that the ratio between S2 and S1 is different for electronic recoil, which is our background, and for nuclear recoil, which is our expected signal, or some of our expected signal. And as you can see, these are data from calibration data set, but as you can see, the ratio of S2 over S1 is different for the blue dots, which is electronic recoils coming mainly from betas and gammas, and the red dots, which are nuclear recoils, that might come from WIMP, a signal, or they can come from neutron or coherent neutrino scattering in the xenon. So in this way, we can also discriminate uh, between our ER background and our nu nuclear recoil background. So why xenon? <coughs> uh, so the event rate of dark matter particles with the material of the detector follows these quantities, where rho zero is the uh, local density, this 0.3 GeV per centimeter, 0.3 GeV, the cross-section, the WIMP nuclear cross-section sigma, and the number of nuclei, this determines just by the mass of the detector, and we have this enhancement of A square of coherent scattering, uh, <coughs> which for xenon is roughly 130. So if we look at this, this is an example for uh, 100 GeV WIMP mass with a cross-section of 10 to the minus 47 centimeter square, we see that xenon will expect the most, uh, the event rate for xenon will be the highest. Okay, the second will be germanium, which has its problems of upscaling, of uh, exposure, and then argon, which <coughs> is a bit less, but they have their own advantages, which you, you will hear probably in the next uh, talk about the pulse shape discriminator. So they really have low background, low, way lower than us in that sense. But this is the reason we use, one of the main reasons why we should use, uh, we are using xenon. So going to xenon one ton, this is a, a picture of xenon one ton inside its water tank that is holding it. Uh, this is the cryostat itself holding the TPC inside, and this is the muon Vito, which is filled with water uh, and is coated with reflective uh, foils to reflect the, the light from the muon, that from the Cherenikov light from the muon to reach PMTs. It is also, it has PMTs inside. This is exactly the same thing, but from outside. <laughs> So this is the water tank, 10 meter height and 10 meter in diameter roughly. The cryostat inside and the TPC inside it. And just near it is the infrastructure uh, building. On the top floor we have the cryogenic and purification, DAQ and slow control, recuperation and storage of xenon, Restox, if you read about it, and krypton distillation and xenon analytics. So let's talk about the water tank. So the water tank serves as a passive neutron uh, uh, veto and as an active muon one. We can see that if we, once we fill water above the level of the, of the cryostat itself, we can see that the uh, fraction of event normalized to, 
to when there is no, no water at all, drops from one roughly to zero. So this means we are really stopping radiation from outside to penetrate our detector. You can see uh, once we reach this level, we are already roughly at zero. So this is stopping uh, neutrons from the surrounding. <coughs> In addition, it is uh, active against muon, so when a muon interacts, it will emit a Cherenikov light, and there are 85, uh, 84 high quantum efficiency 18 Shamamatsu PMTs to trigger this, uh, this uh, muon with 99.5% efficiency. This is an example of an event of Cherenikov light inside the, the water. Okay? This reduces the cosmogenic neutrons background to less than 0.01 events per ton year, which is really subdominant for us now. The TPC itself, so the cryostat has 3.2 ton, tons of liquid xenon, 2 tons inside the, t the TPC itself. There are, roughly there are 248 PMTs. It is roughly 1 meter in diameter, 1 meter in length, and the applied uh, drift field is roughly 120 volt per centimeter. This is a picture of us uh, mounting the TPC itself. So these are the PMTs, the top PMT array, <coughs> and the bottom PMT array, there are, as I said, there are 248 3-inch PMTs with quantum efficiency of 35%. Uh, and all of this thing is coated with high reflective PTFE, again, not to lose any photon that uh, will, 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 will be created in the detector. So we are really looking for a few photons. Calibration. <coughs> so... Um, in order to verify that we understand our detector, we need to calibrate it and to see that the response, that we understand the response correctly. Uh, we fit the calibration data to our model, taking into account all the liquid xenon response and the detector features into account. This is for ER and this is for NR. Each of these are a slice on S2, projected, uh <coughs> a slice of S1 projected on S2. And you can see the blue line here is the calibration data, is the model and the crosses are the calibration data, and this will produce us these bands and our discrimination uh, capabilities and our understanding of how we would the signal or a background look like. We w and we can reach, by that we see that we can reach an ER rejection of 99.7% if we take the NR, so the NR is the r this red band, from the median to minus two sigma. So roughly 50% of the signal we, we keep and we lose 99.7% of the background, of the ER background. Right, how do we calibrate the detector? So we use various sources, mainly for, uh, for electronic recoil, we use radon 220 immersed inside the xenon, we circulate it inside the xenon once in a while, and then we need to wait for a couple of days in order to reach so stable condition that we can take dark matter data again. Uh, the, lo the longest half-life is 10.6 hours for uh, the daughters of uh, radon 220. Uh, we use Krypton 83M for uh, stability and monitoring, and we use a neutron DD generator and an americium beryllium source, uh, roughly at the beginning and the end of the science run, to verify our nuclear response, our nuclear recoil responses. So the backgrounds. <coughs> As I said, it's not only better fiducializing, we are actually removing backgrounds from the system. The water tank is one way to do that. We are actually... We, we don't get any radiation from outside. The second step was reducing the krypton level. So we reduced the krypton 85 level to 0.66 particle per trillion. Uh, the krypton, sorry, not the krypton 85, the natural krypton to xenon to 0.66 particle per, tri tri per trillion. And this is done using this online uh, distillation column. <coughs> and as you can see, at the beginning of the run of the distillation column, we were dominated by krypton 85. But already at the beginning of the science run, we were dominated by radon-222, and we have achieved the lowest level uh, of ER background ever achieved. These are uh, previous levels for Panda-X, Lux, and Xenon-100. Radon-222, we get roughly 13.3 micro becquerel per kilogram. We reach that number by careful selection of material. We screen everything to measure that. And this is actually the next step to reduce this for future uh, experiments. So it's not only the fiducialization, we are actually also removing backgrounds from our system. So if we look at the, <laughs> at the total sum of uh, electronic recoil background, we see that uh, the total expected number of, uh, of background dominated completely by radon-222 
is we expect to see 75 plus minus 8 events. We actually measure 82 plus minus 5 as we don't know each event of background, whether it's uh, electronic recoil. We have some uncertainties on that. And this is actually the lowest electronic recoil background ever achieved in the dark matter detector. So this is quite impressive. <coughs> yes. So materials that go inside the, the xenon. So this is mainly from, uh, I think this is mainly from uh, whatever, cobalt, thorium, uh, uranium that goes, <coughs> that the xenon touches along the way while circulating or from PMT materials that produces uh, the PTFE itself has some isotopes that produce uh, background. from everything else except for uh, radon and uh, krypton, which is immersed inside the xenon. So this is usually reduced further by fiducialization. This is the, this is with fiducial volume. Ah, actually this is with fiducial volume. Yeah, this is actually with fiducial volume, single scatter, but before discrimination. So yeah. Right. Of course, we have also nuclear recoil background coming from radiogenic neutrons, mainly. We are dominated by that. Coherent neutrino scattering and cosmogenic neutron, as I said, is below 0.01 uh, events per ton per year. Other types of background that we have to take into account is what we call surface material background. So this is mainly from uh, lead to 210 and polonium 210, which are immersed inside the PTFE itself. The problem with these events that because they happen right near the PTFE, sometimes they introduce a smaller S2 signal because some of the electrons are absorbed, absorbed in the material itself, and they penetrate to the nuclear recoil signal region. So we have to take this into account. Of course, this is suppressed by fiducialization, and of course, we take a data-driven me uh, method to quantify this background. And uh, the last type of background that we have to take into account is the what we call an accidental coincidence background. This happens when an event happens in a place where there is poor light or charge collections. And then you have a lone S1 or a lone S2 which accidentally coincide, producing an event which is not a real event, but it's just a coincidence of uh, two events. <coughs> this is, uh, we took this into account, but this is a uh, small rate in the ROI of NR. We estimate this by sidebands and by uh, comparing our model to radon 220 data, calibration data. So the dark matter search data is uh, blinded. We use a blind analysis. This region here is blinded throughout the whole analysis. We only open it when we are sure of our uh, machinery. This is to avoid for potential bias from event selection, signal to background modification, uh, and all of this. <coughs> The second thing we do is we use salting. And when I say salting, I mean there is an undisclosed number of events which are put in by hand by somebody that only he knows. Well, hopefully not only he, because maybe if something happened to him, but only a small number of people knows this, uh, these events. And he puts them by hand inside to make sure that after we unblind, we don't tweak our, uh, our cuts or our uh, uh, background models or the discrimination. So we really try to remove any uh, human bias that we can. This is actually, yeah, S2, is, I didn't say, but this is S2 is a function of S1. This is the standard uh, plane that you're uh, used to see, and this is S2 is a function of R square. This is just the spatial distribution of events. Right, um, so fiducial volume optimization. As I said, we are no longer at a stage where we want our fiducial volume to be really zero background because we are using a profile likelihood, we are not doing any more accounting experiments. So what we really want is that we can quantify all the background inside the fiducial volume. This is really what we want because we are looking at the shape of each event, of not of each event, but of events. So we, use, uh, <coughs> we, we used to use point, uh, one ton in SR0, um, which I will explain what SR0 in a second. We now use 1.3 ton uh, fiducial volume. This is this uh, magenta line here. We also incorporate, in order to quantify events which are more likely to be surface events, 
or real WIMP event, we also incorporate this core event here, this green line here. So events happening inside this core are more likely to be WIMP than to be from surface, from neutrons or whatever. <coughs> so our analysis actually takes into account S1, S2, the depth, and the radius. The reason why we could uh, make the, the fiducial volume uh, bigger or larger is, of, uh, is due to better improvement in the position reconstruction and the charge up and uh, field corrections between the two runs. The event selection, so each event has to, we, we cut events for three co threefold coincidence of PMTs. So three PMTs need to see something for an event to, to be selected. <coughs> the search region is defined between 3 to 70 photoelectrons in S1. So this is basically this black line here is our selection efficiency. And on these magenta lines are the expected signal from a WIMP. So this is for a 10 GeV WIMP, 50 GeV WIMP, and uh, 200 GeV WIMP. So <coughs> the, the full exposure of, the of this run, so science run zero lasted 32.1 days. Ended here with the Amatricha earthquake. Uh, once we recovered the detector con uh, conditions, we continued for science run one, 246.7 days, giving us a 278.8 live days of exposure times 1.3 tons gives roughly a ton year uh, exposure, which is the largest reported exposure for these types of detector. Results. <coughs> so, the results are summarized in this big table, but before I go through this uh, table, I want to say one thing. Uh, there are two columns here, one which is stated on the region full, and the other is reference. The reference is there mainly from historical reasons. So dark matter detectors used to, to, to report uh, results using counting experiments. So we used to take like a box, make sure that uh, we reject the, the background at 99 point something percent, and then we just count the number of events there, and we say uh, we saw this or that and give a Poisson, a Poisson uh, inference. We no longer do that. We actually use the full parameter space doing a profile likelihood analysis. But from historical reasons, we do report also these events. Okay? But again, it is important to emphasize that the real analysis is done on all of these, on the full region. Okay? Um, <coughs> so the reference region is uh, defined to be from the 50 GeV uh, WIMP signal median to the minus 2 sigma. Uh, we can see that ER is the most dominant for the full region. Of course, for the, for the reference region, it, it reduces dramatically because we choose exactly the rejection, right? Um, <coughs> for, the, for this region, for the reference region, we see that surface materials are the, the most dominant background. So the volumes are the same, but the difference is where do we cut? Do we take everything in this parameter space or do we take only from the median and below? Okay, so the physical volumes are the same, but in this parameter space of S2 over S1, we can cut from the median of, 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 of expected WIMP only from below, okay? Yeah, exactly. The, the exposure and the fiducial volume is exactly the same. The differences is just this definition. So the reference region is just between a 50 GeV WIMP median and the minus 2 sigma. This is why you see this reduction in the ER background. Okay? Um, so as I said, all other background components are completely subdominant. And again, let me emphasize, the full statistical interpretation is done using a profile likelihood analysis on this column here. Okay? Right, so let's see the results themselves. So, <coughs> uh, as you can see, these are the results. This was the blinded region here. This is S2 as a function of S1 or as a function is of R square. All the black dots here are events which are completely compatible with ER background. More interesting events has these pie charts, which are the relative PDFs of the best fit for a 200 GeV WIMP mass with this cross section. So let's look for an example. Let's look at uh, uh, let's look at this event here, this pie chart. Okay. So this occurs exactly at the median 
of, uh, of the NR band, right? So you would have think that this is a, a WIMP event. However, if we look at the, at the special location that it happened, we see that it happens really near the walls. So this has a more likelihood to be uh, a surface event, as you can see. 50% of the events occurring here will be surface events, not a WIMP event. Okay? Uh, this event here, for example, you can see happens inside the inner core. So it has a more likelihood to be from a WIMP. Okay, so roughly 50% of the events that will occur here and here in the parameter space will be coming from a WIMP. Sorry? This one is correlated to this one. It's the same event. Yeah. These are the same events, just in different uh, phase spaces. Okay? So we can see these uh, events that happened, for example, here. This is most likely to be from a surface material. Of course, this is more likely to be from uh, electronic recoil as it sits on the closer to the ER band. So this is a nice way to see each event, the likelihood of, the, of each event. This is the same thing, but now in, uh, in, in, spatial place, in spatial space. So this is y as a function of x, and this is z as a function of r square. And we see that almost all of the events that are in the inner core are more likely to be electronic recoils and not nuclear recoils. Okay, the ones that are more likely to be nuclear recoils or from WIMPs occur really near the fiducial volume, the fiducial volume here, we can see. Okay? So, <coughs> um, this is the, the background and best fit uh, for, a for a 200 GV WIMP, as I said, with this cross-section. Uh, these are the predictions. So the best fit of the likelihood for this background and signal events, <coughs> we can see that for this is a number of events as a function of S2 minus the median of the ER uh, divided by the cross section. So this is just to say how high or low it is divided by the standard deviation, sorry. Uh, so this is just to say how high or low we are in this S2 over S1 parameter space. So we see that for events that are really ER in high, uh, that in the ER band, we see that uh, the, the black dots here are the data for the 0.9 ton fiducial volume, which is the inner core, and the empty dots are the 1.3. We see that we are compatible with background expectation here and compatible with background expectation here. We have this small deviation here, which eventually turns out to be less than a one sigma effect. So this is really no significant access at any scanned WIMP mass, less than three sigma. The way you do that, you decide a priori what is your threshold? If you don't pass the three sigma, then you produce an exclusion limit. If you do pass the three sigma, then you produce your uh, confidence level contours. This is for coverage reason. So we can produce our exclusion limit. Um, <coughs> so this is the black line here is the 90% confidence level exclusion limit. We can see that uh, the, the, and the green, and this is actually called the Brazilian uh, flag. This is usually in blue. So this is called the Brazilian flag. So the green band is uh, one sigma and the yellow band is the two sigma confidence level. And we see that uh, for any WIMP mass above six JV, our exclusion limit is the best exclusion limit ever produced. And if we compare actually the detectors themselves, so we want to compare the sensitivity, we see that the sensitivity of xenon one ton is roughly a factor seven better than previous sensitivity such as LUX and Panda X2. So what holds for the future? Uh, xenon Anton. So Xenon one ton was, uh, I, I'm finishing in two slides and then we will have time for questions, okay? Um, so Xenon, xenon one ton was already designed to hold Xenon Anton inside it. It's a quick turnover. We only need to change the TPC itself. All the infrastructure can, uh, can handle the Xenon Anton experiment. So it's a minimal upgrade. We will, we will increase the Xenon target by factor four. So we will have four tons in the fiducial volume itself. The background level should be reduced by a factor 10, and this is mainly using this radon distillation column that we are building now. As I said, it's a fast turnaround. We expect to start commissioning by 2019 to start collecting data. And this is basically the expected sens the projected sensitivity for Xenon Anton. As you can see, we will really cut, cut inside here this uh, neutrino floor, mainly from B8 neutrinos coming from the sun. So this is the coherent neutrino floor. So we will cut be cutting through that. 
and as you can see, improving the sensitivity by roughly two orders of magnitude. So to summarize, um, Xenon 1 Ton took a full ton year uh, of dark matter search and has the highest sensitivity for all WIMP masses above 6 GeV. We have achieved the lowest background ever achieved, lowest ER background ever achieved in a dark matter detector. There was no spin independent WIMP signal found in this data. <coughs> Xenon Anton upgrade is in full speed. We expect to see light by 2019. And of course, many more results are on the way, including ER searches, axions, double electron captures, annual modulation, EFT, and many, many more. Thank you very much. So questions, comments? <coughs> Um, yeah, so to have somehow summarize, uh, how many events are left in the region of, of interest after the analysis? How many events? Events. So, so this is basically not a good way to look at it. Yeah, but uh, because how many? No, the reason for that, and, and you know what, maybe I'll go back to this uh, table. The reason why I say it's not a good way to look at it, because you need to look at the shape of events. Yeah, right? but okay. Uh, um, you made uh, all the cuts, you look at the shapes and so on. So how many no, events so are so you using to produce the, um, the um, exclusion limit? That's what so I so the, the, the real what we the in reality what we are doing is that we let the profile likelihood gav give us the best fit for signal events. Okay? Oh. So as you can see here, for example, background expectation was 7.36. Real data yeah, but was this is 14. not the one you are using. You are using the other column, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but here you can emphasize this. We are using this. Here we can see that 735 background expectation, 739 data, completely compatible, right? And still yes. we get a best fit for a WIMP, which is 3.56 events. Okay? So, the okay, the best fit... But even here, what I wanted to say, here it's, it's in more... You can emphasize this. We expected seven events, we saw 14, but the best fit was 1.7 event. And this is the reason why we don't do any more uh, uh, these counting experiments. Because for example, maybe I can draw this on the line, on the board. So for example, if we expect our signal to look, and we expect our signal to look something like this, right? And the background, whatever, right? If you see events here and you see nothing here, then this will pull you down quite strongly, right? So it's not only enough to count the number of events, right? You need to actually see that you have the correct distribution. You, you need to normalize the PDF itself of the events. Right? This is why I was saying it's, it's better to look at it. it. It's kind of hard to understand it from a table of numbers because we don't do this counting experiment anymore. When we had these cuts and we said, oh, well, well we expected to see seven events, we saw 20 events giving Poisson distribution, we get the three sigma access, whatever. Or we saw eight events, it's a zero sigma access. Okay, we don't no lo longer do that. Yeah, okay. so it's to take into account that uh, you had those events that are near the, um, exactly, the surface. Exactly, exactly. So these events here, although they can, they, they do penetrate the, the region that we are looking for, but they are more likely Right, in the likelihood poster, they, they minimize this. Exactly. They are more likely to be background. And of course, for, for example, if we see, just, just an example, if we see, let's say, only this event here, which was, uh, let's say, 90% WIMP. W it cannot happen, but let's say it's co completely compatible with NR and it happens inside here, for example, this one. Right? It's still not enough because in all other uh, energy regions, this, w this actually happens in low energy. But if it would happen here, it will still not be enough because the, po the, the PDF itself of the signal doesn't fit. It might fit to another signal, but for this hypothesis of spin independent, it will not fit. This to S to cut and fiducial as well. Yes. These seven events are also fiducializing. Yes, yes. These seven so events are also fiducialized. Well, fiducial volume is for the reference. It's 1.3 so tons. It's 1.3 ton. Okay. The, the, the fiducial volume that we use for the analysis. Of course, as I said, we have an R dependent, right? So events that will occur near the walls in high radii 
are more likely to be coming from background from surface material or from accidental coincidence, from surface material mainly, right? So, <coughs> as I said, this is not enough to grasp the full, uh, to understand the, the each event, what is this coming from? Yes, but then you lose exposure. Exactly. This is. Yeah, 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 of course. This is why I said we are no longer at the point where we choose our fiducial volume to be the one with zero background. We choose our fiducial volume to be the one where we fully understand or best understand and quantify the background. Of course, yeah. Y essentially, you would like to not have any fiducial volume, right? To take the whole data from the whole experiment, right? You need to. Co it's an optimization between your understanding of the background and uh, increasing the exposure. As a question, comment? Yeah. So suppose we take an image event. We truly have in a wind event. So how many sigmas are you far away from Dama? How many sigmas are we far away from Dama? I mean, if you put a more stringent constraint on the uh, on Dama results. So Dama results were alri already fully excluded by Xenon 100 yeah. from the first, from what we call run one. Sure, I know that. Right? Not from <laughs> <laughs> so I, I we, did we didn't even check. I mean, we can see in this, <laughs> in this here. So Dama should be uh, somewhere here, right? <laughs> We, we don't even plot that anymore. <laughs> okay, okay, but I'm somehow you can put that out even out of scale to say, oh, this is Dama. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but Thank it's you. completely excluded. Not, not only by us, by the way, by, by <laughs> other experiments as well, right? Okay, so let's thank uh, Ron again. <laughs> Maximo. So now Maximo is going to, to tell us about a similar detector, but uh, going from Xenon to Argon. This is like a 50 kilogram experiment. So, uh, huh? uh, I see. Better. Hello. <laughs> so, that side is a experiment which is actually very similar to the type of detec detectors that Shannon uses, which is our time projection chamber, but the difference is that it, it uses like an argon target. You know. So here I, I just show uh, just the rate above threshold per ton day as a function of the recoil energy uh, for Shannon and argon and two masses, 2.5 GeV and 50 GeV. So you, you can see that the, the shape is different. And the uh, Xenon and Argon reality are complementary, in my opinion, because uh, if a signal is ever found, uh, these uh, different cutoffs will help to disentangle the problem. So, now, in this slide, I just want to show like some uh, review plot from the particle data book, which is just a wind mass in the range of 1 to 2, 1 uh, TeV, versus the a spin independent cross section and uh, you can see that well first of all uh, what is the situation ab above like between 20 GV and 1 TV in WIMP searches no I mean in reality the first thought models have been constrained quite long uh, ago by by Shannon collaboration and uh, there is a still room there is a still room for some from uh, some models 
Uh, and but I think the neutrino flow is the, the main target of the next generation of experiments. On the other hand, the region between 1 GeV and uh, 10 GeV is weakly constrained, and it's only a small set of dedicated experiments like DAMIC or CDMS slide. So, so this is the the situation. In the results I'm going to be presenting are cover like the both the low mass and the high mass range. So the DASIC collaboration is like a, it has it's an international collaboration with uh, Italian, USA, Russia, Spain, France, China, Brazil, and Poland groups. And also there's a group here in Brazil uh, that the USP and UNICAMP have like members. The dark side uh, experiment is hosted by the Grand, Naso by the, uh, Grand Sasso uh, Laboratory in Italy. The, the idea of the dark side program uh, is to build, like any other experiments, to build increasingly larger sizes of it. Right now we are like in dark side 50, which is 50 kilograms. The next it will be dark side proto, which it will be, will have maybe some physics run, but uh, ma mainly will be a prototype for the big one. And uh, this dark side proto is about one ton. Dark side 20K will be about 20 ton and there's some thinking about doing even a 200 ton experiment. No? In order to build all this, a new collaboration has been formed, gathering together like uh, groups working in the different uh, experiments uh, that work with Argon Target, mainly uh, DS50, RDM, and the DEEP 3600 uh, uh, experiment. So the goals here are like a uh, basically to do uh, the wind search down to the neutrino floor with almost no background. And this is possible with Argon target. Uh, difficult, I mean, it will not be easy, but it, it's possible in principle. The design, uh, the design is, is gonna be uh, basically a double phase time projection chamber, which is uh, provides an X, Y, Z visualization and single, single and multiple scatter identification. This is the technology used by the Shannon and actually is the most scalable one and it provides like a uh, 3D identification of the target. So basically uh, it's qu rather powerful. The target is the argon and the discrimination is will be through pool shape and initiation to scintillation ratio, the S2 over S1. So Shannon uses S2 over S1 ratio and uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so Shannon uses like uh, S2 over S1, but the uh, argon has also pull shape discrimination. And uh, also, the it uses an uh, underground argon naturally depleted in argon 39. <laughs> so y this is very important because if not, uh, the, the and this is the reason why argon target was not used before because the rate of atmospheric. Arg argon 39 is, is about one becker per kilogram, so you, you want to build one ton, it's about 1,000 hertz in your detector, 20 tons is 20,000 hertz. So it's really important to have like a uh, uh, depleted argon, and this has been achieved by extracting argon from uh, underground sources. Uh, the outer detectors, which is uh, provides shielding also on B2 neu neutrons. So uh, now I'm going to be talking uh, more about the time projection chamber. It's a uh, usual, uh, the DS50 time projection chamber, which is a, a 46.4 kilogram total mass, fiducial mass. And uh, it's very similar in the sign to, uh, in the sign to the Shannon that I was described before. So I will not spend too much time on that, but basically the main difference is, is like, a whoop, we have to code the TPC with TPB because the wavelength emission of the of the scintillation light in argon is 128 nanometers. So that's that's actually the main difference between the TPCs. No? But otherwise, the principle is the same. So you have like a, a scintillation event is one that triggers your detector, and then the electron is drifting, uh, and the drift time gives you the set position, and you produce uh, the S2 signal through electroluminescence in the in the top array of PMTs. This is the basic principle. 
uh, this is a, a I show here like an example of like the principal equation. You have an S1 and then you have an S2. The S1 is the what we call the scintillation signal. It's like a 10 microsecond pulse with two components. And uh, uh, this this pulse, the fraction of light within the first nin 90 nanoseconds, is the so-called F90, it is very powerful, indiscriminated between electron recoil and nuclear recoil. The S2 signal, uh, the initiation signal, which is the electron drifting in the chamber and producing electromagnetic light, uh, is very is very important for three reasons. First of all, it gives you the set position, the drift time. Uh, second, it gives you also the position, the XY position through the fraction of light in each PMT, and then it has also a, a electron recall to nuclear recall discrimination. This uh, S2 over S1, which is equation, we are not using it at the moment, but uh, well actually, yeah, in the last one paper we use it. But the it's the pull shape discrimination what is important, and here is it's it illustrated here. Here you have an event which is electron recoil and nuclear recoil, and you can see that the elect this is the time in microseconds. So you can see that the electron the nuclear recoil is much uh, much faster. It has like uh, the uh, scintillation light has two components: one six nanoseconds, another one point six microseconds. Nuclear recoils tend to produce a lot of light within the first ninety, na 90 nanoseconds. So you can see here, uh, this is the distribution taken from atmospheric argon data of electron recoils and uh, uh, for different values. So you will have a very good way of calibrating the F90 from electron recoils. For nuclear recoils, we use a beryllium, beryllium, and beryllium carbon data. No? For uh, beryllium, beryllium, and beryllium carbon data. Uh. Ah, Meridian carbon data, yeah. So this is a, a summary of that of what we are doing. Basically, we have this F90 parameter versus S1. No, so your electron recalls like uh, are confined in the lower part, and uh, your nuclear recalls. This is the 50% uh, line for the nuclear recalls. So you define a box which we call the Wimps Arch region, in which uh, you count how many events you have inside that box. The main difference with argon with xenon is that the that the, the electron the F90 electron recoil leakage into the neutron recoil bound is very small. It's very small. It's one in, in ten to the seven. So basically uh, you can do it Babylon free. Uh, there's a caveat here, of course, because the, there is a decrease in reaction power due to photo photostatistics, of course. Uh, this this is a a number that depends on what is you uh, what do you choose for the nuclear recoil band and uh, what do you choose for the electron rec electron rec recoil leakage line okay so the outer detectors are basically we have what in sharing of detectors uh, which is a uh, eight pmt and 1000 tons and liquid scintillation beta which is 110 10 pmt is 30 tons free free diameter Inside that, we have the TPC and the cryostat. So the idea here is just like uh, uh, not only to shield, basically the water channel of attack shields against radiation, but a part of shielding from external neutrons, which are the cosmogenic neutrons. Water does it very well. And uh, uh, you need to also detect uh, the radiogenic neutrons, the internal neutrons. And for that, uh, we built like uh, the LSB, an LSB which is a liquid scintillation beta detector that uses boron loaded, sti boron loaded scintillator and achieving a neutron detection rejection efficiency of 99.64%. So uh, the dark side 50 took a long run, it's uh, 532 days, 32 days, and uh, basically it was used a blank analysis, so all the data in the region of uh, in this region f90 s1 this big red box was blinded in terms of f90 no and then uh, you do your modeling and uh, you you build your model and then you define uh, the region where you want to count finally count your you and put the limit on which is this is the dash line and then you put a limit the backgrounds the backgrounds we have is nuclear recalls and electron recalls so uh, nuclear recalls 
uh, basically are, are uh, surface backgrounds, uh, radiogenic neutrons and cosmogenic neutrons. The electron recalls are basic, are mostly gammas and uh, internal betas. No, so this is the final background budget after, after, um, after all uh, cuts are defined. So the events. 534 days. So, so basically, the idea of the blind analysis is that uh, you have like you plan your data, uh -huh. and then uh, you construct cuts to reach 0 0.1 events. This is the the idea. So this number is 0 0.1 by definition because the 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 the, the, the dark matter box was chosen to contain 0 0.1 event background. Yeah. Yeah. Five hundred thirty. So, so the. Yeah, yeah. I I will I will explain I will explain a little bit. But basically, the idea is that, that you you have like you you blend your data, you build your model, and then you you build your model on the basis of the model that you can uh, check with uh, some calibration data as well. You define a region where you want to do the co your counting experiment. And yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will talk about that after in a couple of slides. So. I will talk now about the backgrounds. So first of all, we have like the alpha background. Uh, the alpha background here I showed like uh, the distribution, the energy spectrum in S1 of the alpha backgrounds, which are mainly polonium 210, radon 222, and polonium 218. And uh, these are not like really a problem in our case. First of all, like uh, the the these alpha backgrounds lie in an energy very very like 5 MeV there's alpha so so they are too high so the only problem that you can have is just if you have like some alpha that I is produced very close to the due to the wall so part of the energy gets inside of the TPC but in that case you have like a visualization for those ones a very loose visualization completely removes them now it, it is a it is a nice plot because actually the the, the no, it's not shown here, but the radon 222 and polonium 218 are in the bulk, no? And the, the polonium 210 is mostly in the walls. And that's because, like, uh, these are produced by radon emanation in the argon. And then uh, the resulting, since uh, polonium, uh, radon 222 and polonium 218 uh, ha uh, has, like, the decay time is about three minutes, so basically, but then to go from polonium 218 up to polonium 210, you have like a, a decay there. One of the elements in the chain has a decay of 22 years. So basically, the 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 daughters of the radon 222 gets accumulated in the walls. That's that's what uh, is happening. If not, it should be in secular equilibrium somehow. But Alphas in general are not a problem because either they are outside the range, outside energy range, or either in the walls. So the neutron background abatement. So uh, this is a we have like a neutron beta, which is really really efficient. No, so the there's two ways that you can detect the neutrons through a delay signal, which is neutron capture, or through a prompt signal in which uh, it's called neutron thermalization. So basically, the neutron gets out and then gets back in thermalizes, gets out, gets a thing, and finally is captured. No? So this, these two, each one has like a above like a 99% a a detection efficiency. The challenge, the one, one, one good thing of the, um, of the neutron captures that we are using is that we're using boron 10, which produces an alpha. Alpha is a, is a short a range particle, so you don't have all those problems of the gammas escaping your uh, beta detector. So so this high rejection efficiency allows you to uh, basically tag neutrons and, and count neutrons and identify neutrons. So this is F90 versus S1. 
So uh, events uh, that are selected on the basis of the prompt LSB signal, so you can see here, this is the 50% line for the neutrons, so you can see here the 11 neutrons that we have, and you can uh, study them. You can say, okay, it's cosmogenic because in the water channel of the detector there was like a and there was a signal, or it's a fission candidate because there's like three simultaneous neutron captures in that event, or it's a, it's a radiogenito otherwise. No? So, uh, of course, these 11 events, given that you have a factor of 200 suppression in the given by the veto, you, you don't have an event uh, in your final. Uh, so more problematic are the betas, in this case, <laughs> and the betas and the gamma. So the beta and gamma background, First of all, what, the, what uh, we do is just do it like a, a prediction and refining of the say activities. No? So this is a spectrum, or energy spectrum data compared with Monte Carlo, with our current understanding of the Monte Carlo. No? And you can see here like uh, that the, the, the our main background, is here you have argon 39. Uh, sorry, Krypton 85, and here you have argon 39. So you can see you can see that our main background is gammas, gammas coming mainly mostly from the PNTs. No. So. Uh, Is you have gammas from lead to ten, I mean also. No, because this is just uh, split it in chains. This is the thorium-232 chain, the potassium-40, the uranium lower chain, 238 chain. So in the uranium lower, uh, lower chain, you have like a radon-222, polonium-222. You have all... It's uh, split it in chains. So we assume in this fit that the... Low, uh, low. Yeah. Yeah, low. So in this case, it was uh, split in the indications, and the the up the uranium two thirty eight was uh, split in the upper and the lower. Uh, was not assumed secular equilibrium in this case. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so so basically, this is uh, this is our main background. No, but it should be suppressed by the push shape uh, discrimination, but it was not in this case. So the our main problem here was like uh, our main background in DS50 was a gamma that has a, a small probability, but it has a probability of 10 to minus 4. Actually, to interact in the Teflon, produce uh, a produce electron above the above the Cherenkov threshold, produce Cherenkov light, gets inside the chamber, and deposit a small energy, and then you have like a S2 signal, and then uh, you have an S1 signal with a contamination of very fast light, which is Cherenkov. No. And this is the main reason why the discrimination was spoiled, otherwise the electron recall background should be zero. No. And uh, it was not expected, because it's very delicate, because it's in the last millimeter of the Teflon that you have this light. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean... So basically, the, the outcome of this is just you have the F90 distribution in a given uh, S1 range. You have like a, this is the distribution of a, S this is the distribution in fused silica. There's two types of channel, but I don't want to mislead you. Just uh, look at the green ones, which is this. This is the Teflon channel of compared to what we expect, more or less. So there's a huge tail. These tails are these tails are exponentially suppressed. So basically, the Teflon Cherenkov introduces a tail that completely spoils our pore shape discrimination. So in order in the in, in, in order to get rid of this uh, Teflon Cherenkov, so we have to change the uh, the WIMP search region, decrease the size of the WIMP search region, and perform some <coughs> SQI said fiduciarization. So this is the final plot of 90 versus S1 with a, a box in which we are doing our counting experiment and there's no events in the box so accordingly you set a limit on that. So the 
uh, yeah compared to the it was used to be 30 kV but uh, it was decreased it was basically decreased because of this Teflon because the Teflon Cherenkov is very bad uh, for like uh, around uh, S1 of 50 60 p p it has like a cutoff around like 80 p 80 photoelectrons so basically uh, yeah yeah so the the, the background the Cherenkov background was bad uh, Uh, this is the the, plot. the cross section limit, the dark side to 2015 and the 2018. So you can see that uh, it moved a little bit the the curve. But so that's the, the cross section limits of, uh, of this counting experiment. It's important to say that the the Teflon uh, the Teflon Cherenkov background, which is uh, is something that that we now understand. Uh, so the next generation, of course, the, re the reflector design is gonna change. Uh, it's not it's there's not gonna be a Teflon anymore. No, it's gonna be free M foils. So okay, so. Finally, I just want to dedicate a few slides to this uh, other searches in like a smaller uh, for smaller wind masses between two and ten GeV. So basically, between two and ten GeV, uh, we should see wimps as well. No, I mean I think in the center you had like a threshold for the physics analysis of uh, ten G ten kV. For the standard, uh, this is the non-standard. Uh, yeah, this is S2 only. Basically, the idea is here is just the uh, between one and ten GeV. If you are sensible to one kV neutron equivalent, then you should be able to see WIMPs. No, uh, there's no electron recoil, neutron recoil discrimination in this case, but uh, and the sensitivity depends on the over overall background level. No, so one kV neutron equivalent is too small. So the scintillation signal threshold is too high, so you have to use the ionization signal only, no? And to get an idea, for argon, a uh, 1 kV neutron equivalent corresponds to 5 to 9 electrons. Now here I show like the, the ionization yield versus the energy of the, rec of the nuclear recoil, uh, some experimental data that I don't have too much time to review, but basically there is co our current knowledge of the ionization yield, and it should be around between five and nine electrons for one kV ne ne neutron equivalent. We are m uh, we're actually trying to measure now at one kV as well the ionization yield. So one uh, one electron is actually a quite big signal in the detector. <laughs> so one electron is basically 23, 23 photoelectron at the center of the TPC. So our acceptance as a function of the S2 size, so the number of photoelectrons in the signal is uh, shown here and uh, so you have like here the, the above like about 30 photoelectrons you are fully efficient no and this number that is not one is 0 0.42 because we don't use the whole tpc we just use like the central the central part of the tpc because it has less background and it has a, a better single electron resolution because our s2 depends on xy and uh, so we use only the, the TPP, <laughs> but basically above like 30 photoelectrons we are fully uh, efficient. So basically five to nine electrons is a signal that we can easily recognize. No? Uh, so the next I want to show is just the any spectrum. This is the, the spectrum in e events per kilogram day per beam versus any, no? And here is shown two thi two curves. Like is one is like the the dark blue, which corresponds to the overall spectrum. The red corresponds to the single <coughs> S2 S2 only events. And then the uh, and then you have like the light blue, cor which is S1 plus S2 events. As you can see, uh, you can see here like there are two peaks, two clear peaks here. These two clear peaks corresponds to argon 37. That was like uh, produced during the flight of the shipping when we were shipped the, ar the underground argon by plane, and uh, 
and you can see the argon 37 basically the, the l2 L to K ratio of the electron recalls is well reproduced, and you can see a clear signal uh, at about like 10 electrons. So, but of course, for searches, we don't use the data set because uh, this is we use just the last 500 days. No? Uh, here is just the expected any spectrum for the WIMPs uh, with the last 500 days data and also the uh, com the, the prediction from the Monte Carlo. So you can see that uh, for 10 to minus 40 square centimeter WIMP with masses between 2.5 GeV and 10 GeV, you can exclude easily. So then you have like your corresponding cross-section limits in the range, which are pretty good in the range 2 to like uh, 8 GeV or like uh, uh, as best as uh, as best as it, it can get, no? as good as it gets. Uh, so the D50 has an essential situation in the 2 to, to 10 GeV mass range, and this wouldn't be possible without the underground argon. And there's also very good pros prospects for DS proton DS20K uh, because DS50 is not a particularly uh, quiet experiment. Uh, it's it, was it was not designed to be like to have a very, very, very low background because you were relying on the push shape discrimination. The next uh, step would be like the DS20K, which is a, it's a new collaboration formed with uh, like a different uh, form within the argon community. It will use like uh, the main features is it will use like radio pure silicon PMTs. Uh, there will be uh, underground procurement and purification, uh, aria and uranium. So we will have like uh, the underground argon that we have in DS15. Also, like it can be further purified if needed. The data taking is expected to start from 2022. Uh, the Cherenkov uh, background abatement, uh, it's, I mean, Cherenkov will inhibit it in this detector. And the neutron, uh, basically, will use like a cryogenic better system. This is the current plan. The amount of underground argon will be 50 ton. And uh, we are targeting less than 0 0.1 events per 100 ton year. And uh, there is uh, some scalability in the design for like 300 tons. So this is a picture of what uh, is the current design of uh, DS20K. And the expected sensitivity for the, in the spin independent cross section for the DARSA 20K and Argo, no? which is, so this is the, okay, so that's, that's it. I have uh, two questions. Uh, two questions. First question is about uh, silicon photomultipliers, <coughs> which you, you called in the, uh, uh, low radioactive act active these uh, radiation photomultipliers. Who will produce this device? Uh, it should be much lower radioactive compared yeah. to the ones that we are using. Uh, what will be the actual value of the the of the radioactivity? We will know when we we do the prototype, uh, which okay. will happen this coming year. And second uh, uh, question to both collaborations: Nobody of you mentioned about your data acquisition system. Could you comment how you reading data? Do you have any trigger or what? Uh, or you just reading? Uh, Data, uh, data like uh, oscilloscope, everything. Uh, in in this case, it is not zero to press for this 50, because uh, the rate was like about one hertz, and so it is sustainable with a two nanosecond flash disease. Sustainable for this 20k, depending on the trigger rate, on the expected physics rate, uh, you will have to do. Do so. you use standard uh, data acquisition from from Kion, for example, or you? Somebody from your team designing this. So for for which one? For DS50 or for yeah. DS? For DS50 is a kind. I think it's just not just not, uh, not very. It's not a. It's a not very complicated. The S20K is a problem. Yeah, it, you need some infrastructure. Yes. 
because uh, we will have some some, some gammas. I mean, the trigger rate is not going to be 100 hertz, but it's going to be 20 hertz or something like that. And you need to read like 8,000 PMTs and uh, silicon PMs, and so. so it's Was a question or comment? Then thank Maximo again. Okay. And last talk from Juan. So now going to another technology, totally different and lower mass. Okay, I'm uh, going to tell you about another technology for looking at dark matter. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about charge couple devices, experiments for dark matter and neutrinos, actually. Okay, uh, I'll try to go over this fast because we all want to go for lunch. So uh, CCDs are uh, charge coupled detectors that have very low readout noise. Right? And that's the main advantage that has made them usable for uh, a lot of applications in uh, astronomy and now in these dark matter and neutrino searches. The way you get to the low noise is uh, by having a detector array where uh, you can only measure the the charge deposited in the very last pixel and then you come up with some clever way to move the charge from where you collect it to the pixel where you measure it, right? And that clever way got some people to win a Nobel Prize uh, in 2009. So the, the performance of the detector is, uh, you know, typical scientific CCDs ach achieve less than two electrons of noise and that, if you put that in terms of charge, is about 7.6 electron volt. Sorry, 7.2 electron volt, I should say. Okay, so what we do for dark matter is uh, have a big chunk of silicon. No recent developments in, uh, in astronomy have uh, moved to much thicker CCDs, and for that reason, we now have massive CCDs, right? CCDs that can accumulate up to uh, 10 or 15 grams per device. Uh, well, before they were much lower than one gram, right? So this means that you can now build uh, an active mass of silicon uh, with CCDs when the a nuclear recoil, uh, when when uh, dark matter recoils with a with a nucleus, it produces uh, ionization due to this recoil, and we collect that ionization, right? So now we are using detectors uh, like this for uh, the DAMIC, the dark matter uh, search with CCDs, and the CONI uh, coherent neutrino nucleus interaction uh, experiment with CCDs. Both of these uh, experiments have a lot of participation of Latin American groups and Brazilian groups. Uh, okay, so the detector is uh, this thing here, right? Is is six centimeters by six centimeters, 16 million pixels. You read it out on these very low noise corners of the detector. So you move the charge from everywhere into these corners. And that's how you read it out. You get two electrons of background. This is a, a CCD package that we put together for CONI and for DAMIC uh, with the controlling the materials around the, the package. So this is all uh, copper. And then we package, uh, we, we mount the silicon detector, right, this square, into a substrate of the same silicon. So it's all very... Uh, pure uh, 
you know, we try to not to introduce any any uh, uh, new material next to the detector. Okay, so how does this look? This is uh, the particle identification that you can do with a CCD. So this is an exposure at the lab, uh, at the surface. So you can see muons. These muons are the minimum ionizing tracks that look like straight lines here, right? You can see uh, electrons that produce these uh, worm-like uh, structures. They are uh, typically generated by Compton from a high energy gamma. And then you have these little dots that uh, is what you see when the charge is deposited in only one pixel. And then the size of the reconstructed charge uh, cloud depends on where in that pixel it happened, right, because of the charge diffusion. Right, so this is how the detector, uh, the images look, and when we look for dark matter, we just put the detector in a place where every f every uh, everything else is uh, suppressed by shield going underground, and we try to count how many of these dots we see. That's the job, right? This is a very uh, good detector for X-rays. So we can calibrate that uh, very precisely with X-rays. We do that all the time. So we have two uh, running experiments using this technology. One is for uh, the DAMIC uh, collaboration. Uh, this is the a collaboration that has a, a few groups in Latin America. I started with this group of people in two in 2013, um, we have pu uh, put out uh, a f uh, many results, right? Uh, we have a very, because of our position resolution, we have nice uh, measurements of our of our radiation uh, background, and we also, you know, that informs other experiments using silicon. We also produce a WIMP search that uh, you can see here, that was published in 2016. Uh, we are coming up with a new uh, result very soon. And we, uh, in 2017, we produced the first uh, direct detection constraints on EV hidden photon uh, dark matter search. Right. So this is uh, looking for, l for uh, the hidden photon absorption in the, in the silicon. Right. Uh, anyway, so this is going well. It's taking data. It's running. This is not the focus of my of my talk uh, today. This is the technology that we have been using until now. I'll tell you what we are doing now. Uh, this is uh, the other experiment, the Coni collaboration. Uh, put this together and started collecting data in 2014, and we published our first result in 2016 with the engineering run of the detector, and we have uh, very nice data looking for for uh, coherent scattering in uh, in the neutrinos. Uh, this is uh, where our detector is located, right next to a nuclear uh, reactor in Angra Ray, ab uh, about a four and a half hours drive from where we are now. Well, if you can get out of Sao Paulo first. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so these are all the, the ne neutrino fr uh, from reactors in the world. This is where we are located. It's a very nice facility, very nice place to work. You have access to the reactor. You have good support from the people. And, and the team here in, in uh, well, actually in Rio de Janeiro is uh, driving the operations of this uh, experiment. Okay, so we have the data. We this. The results are coming very soon. We essentially compare the data th with the, the reactor on and the reactor off, and the signal uh, should show up in this very low energy part uh, of the of the spectrum. And we are do doing uh, studies of systematics effect there, so that we put a good constraint on on uh, that, that we have a good uh, estimation of those systematics for our final result. So this is coming soon. Okay, but this is not the main part of my talk. M my, what I really wanted to tell you about is what we are, are doing now, uh, what is the next step in this technology. 
and what we think we are going to be doing when you have the Andes uh, experiment going on, right? The Andes laboratory. So uh, recently we have been able to demonstrate the Skipper CCD. This is a technology that was uh, established in, in uh, that was uh, designed in 1990, so many many years ago, and uh, we, you know. A group at Fermilab led by Javier Tiefenberg was able to put together the to to uh, demonstrate the the optimal performance of this device after a lot of work for many years with a lot of group is uh, were were doing this so uh, now we can uh, read this skipper CCD with zero noise and the way you do that is uh, without going into the details of of technical details, but the way you do it is by measuring each pixel an infinite amount of times or, you know, a lot of times without destroying the charge. So a uh, typical CCD is you read uh, the charge of a pixel one time and then you throw it away. Uh, in this skipper CCD you can read the, the charge of a pixel uh, 10,000 times and average all the measurements without losing anything other than time, right? It takes more time to read it up. So uh, this is how it works. This is a uh, hopefully I can make this movie work. Uh, okay. Okay. This is how it doesn't work. Right? But <laughs> okay. So, oops. <laughs> it's working very nicely in my own screen. Right, so what you will see here, when I make this run, is uh, a real image of a CCD where uh, this number will show the number of, of samples that you are reading out, and this is the noise on the image. This is the histogram of all the charge, the pixels, right? So it's just averaging, taking more and more averages over the same data, and you can see here one electron, right? This image has one electron in this pixel, at when you read it one time, you see nothing. As you keep doing the average, then that uh, single uh, electron becomes very, very significant, right? <laughs> this is real data. And the average is really done uh, in, an in a digital way, so you can do this, right? Uh, the, the detector is very, gives you a lot of flexibility. In principle, you could choose to uh, just do this multiple sampling on this guy and start ignoring the next pixels and then concentrate on a pixel and measure infinite. So you can have a region of interest where you control the noise on each pixel. Anyway, it's very cool, right? Very, very cool. So uh, this is what we are doing now. This is the next step for us in terms of uh, CCDs for dark matter and, and neutrinos. This is how you drop the noise to zero. Right, so this is the, the the readout noise, and and the number of samples per pixel, and you can bring it down to to uh, as low as you want, essentially. This is the difference, right? This is the paper from Javier. Uh, this is the difference between uh, what we are doing now and what you get with the Skipper CCD, where you can count. Individual electrons, this has a noise of 1.8 electrons, I which is very nice, but this has a noise of 0 0.05 electrons. And you can keep counting all the way, you know, 40, 50 electrons. You can look at an X-ray that has uh, around 1,500 electrons and then zoom in and count the, p the electrons there. So there because there is no gain, there is no gain dispersion, you can really count electrons all the way to a very large, uh, yeah. Yes, single, yes. single electrons all the way to 10,000, right? Okay, so what are we doing with this? The first thing that we're doing is a dark uh, sector, da a hidden sector search. So, uh, okay, there's a lot of people that know more uh, have better ways of explaining this theory than me, right? And you probably have some of them here. But uh, I'm going to tell you that, you know, we have the standard model particles and the hidden sector that uh, could be uh, 
where the dark matter particles are, and then there is some vector particle that connects the two things, right? Some, uh, some portal. So one option is for that portal to be something that we call a, a dark photon mediator. These are some slides from our collaborator Ruben Essig. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the, the standard model is then connected to the dark sector that has the dark matter particle and this mediator uh, with some uh, interaction. And the idea is to see if you can uh, get to that interaction. The, the, you know, you can focus on two ways, where, uh, on two possibilities of a light uh, or ultralight mediator. There are some constraints from cosmology for other, for other options, right? So the light mediator where, you know, the mass of the mediator is uh, smaller than two times the mass of the, of the uh, dark matter particle, allows this thing to become in thermal equilibrium as pretty much as a standard WIMP, you can produce an annihilate as the uh, universe is cooling down. So you get this freeze out uh, density for the, for the standard, mo for the uh, dark matter uh, particles. And then you can look for direct detection of these dark matter particles. But now the dark matter particle will be much smaller, right? The masses are MEV. Yeah. And, uh, and you will not be able to see a nuclear recoil. So I will skip this, right? Uh, you will concentrate uh, now on electron recoils. So you look for electron recoil dark matter because this is the right energy scale for this uh, process now. And you will look for uh, you will look for your event y in your detector. You will look for one electron where it there should be none, right? So that's why the skipper CCD is a very nice thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is assuming dark photons, so you look you look for this process, right? Okay, so that's a, the new plan now is forget about the WIMPs. Let's look at the electron recoils from these things and the skipper CCD is ex ex exactly the device that you would like to have to do that. This shows an example of how these searches were done in the past, no, with xenon 10. Uh, you, you heard about that uh, a few minutes ago, and a Sensei uh, experiment, no, this skipper dark matter search with 10 uh, grams of active mass, right? Remember the size that we were talking about before. Ten, this is 10 grams of active mass and three hours of operation <coughs> puts a limit that uh, is better than than uh, for this for this very low dark matter mass is better than the other experiments. Uh, and you know you can look at 100 grams one year. So this is what we are doing now. We have a project funded to develop this 100 gram one year experiment. Okay, I will skip this right because it's, it's very late. But I will. Uh, this is where we are. This is a sensei experiment, so we don't need uh, a, a very <laughs> large volume, right? Uh, uh, this is our uh, sensei doer. Uh, this is our readout electronics. Uh, yeah, we are at Fermilab, right? In the un in the shallow underground site at Fermilab. This is one of the of the, the detectors, 4K by by uh, almost 900, so it's almost 4K by 1K. Uh, this is not the detector we are using now, but uh, it looks very similar. So before taking the detector underground, we took some data to characterize the detector on the surface. And this is the spectrum that we got from darks on the surface. And this is corresponds to just a few hours of exposure, a total of 0 0.02 grams day. Right? And using that 0 0.2, 0 0.02 grams day exposure, this is the limit that we get for that search of uh, electron recoil in the dark sector. Right? So we are very excited about this and we are pushing on this technology uh, forward and uh, even though we have a detector that is less than a gram working now, we are on the way to putting together a, a 100 gram detector, which I guess is not as impressive as, as n tons, but uh, we'll get there eventually. Right? Okay, so uh, 
what is that we we uh, are doing now with CCDs? I wanted to gi give you this this uh, idea so that uh, if you want to talk about the other projects, we can we can talk in more detail, right? But so with the standard CCD, we have uh, Damic uh, 100, which is running at Snow Lab with about 50 grams of active mass. That is taking data now. It show has some of the papers that show before and, and, and more is coming from there. Uh, we have Coni running here at Angra with 50 grams of active mass next to a 4 gigawatt reactor. <coughs> we have Coni uh, running at the minor reactor, so it's one gram of active mass at one uh, megawatt reactor. We just installed that and we are talking with the uh, group at Texas to uh, understand the, the operations of it, but we are just starting that. <coughs> uh, then with the Skipper CCD, we have the Sensei R&D setup running with less than one gram at Fermilab, right? This is the one that I show you. This is the one that produced the initial results from the surface uh, run. Then we have Sensei 10, 10 gram experiment at Fermilab starting to operate in 2019. The schedule is driven by the delivery of the new silicon detectors that we, we fabricated for this experiment. Sensei 100 is uh, 100 gram of active mass at Snow Lab or SURF. I, we are leaning towards Snow Lab, uh, but, but we have uh, discussions with, with both labs. The idea is that uh, this will be ready by the end of, uh, by, uh, be installed by the end of 2019. And then Damic M is uh, uh, the continuation of the, of the Damic collaboration, right? The Damic 100, most of the people in the Damic 100 team, plus some uh, additional uh, members uh, from Europe mostly, are putting together a one kilogram experiment uh, at Modan in, a, in something that is like a five year program to complete the one kilogram, right? So there are several smaller R&D efforts, no? C a CubeSat with this technology, quantum imaging. So the, the lab where I work is investing significantly in this uh, R&D for, for Skipper because it's considered an interesting technology and we want to push for the, fu uh, develop the full potential of this detector. And the main R&D effort that is going on now is scaling up this technology to get more than 10 kilograms of active mass. And this uh, scaling up is an engineering effort and is a significant uh, investment in money, right? To understand how to go from a single CCD to a, an array of 4,000 or so. Okay, and why do we need to do this? We want to do this because uh, we, once you have 20 kilograms or so of, of this detector, then you can look for uh, sterile neutrino oscillations with, uh, this is shown with a, a nuclear reactor, you can do an experiment with a neutrino source also, where you will look for the disappearance of the standard neutrino uh, with uh, at a very short uh, scales because, uh, so, uh, very short distances because of the low energy of the neutrinos that you are going to be looking at. You can also monitor nuclear reactors, so some, uh, some colleagues from, uh, from the national security business are thinking about how to monitor uh, plutonium in, uh, in, blank in uh, breathing blankets from, from nuclear reactors, and that gives you a signal uh, of neutrinos at very low energies, below the energy that you have for inverse beta uh, decay, so you cannot detect it in the standard uh, uh, reactor de detector, so that's why coherent uh, detection is will be nice, and if you can do it with the CCD of, uh, you can do it with a CCD of about uh, 10 kilograms. Anyway, so uh, there's, l there's reasons in different parts, and of course the focus of uh, going for larger dark matter experiments is also there. So finally, you know, what I wanted to say is what we think we are going to be doing 10 years from now, right? When you have Andes ready. So uh, we uh, are developing now the capability of building detector arrays of uh, uh, large masses, right? We uh, estimate a, pr a price tag of 15 million for a 50 kilogram detector with uh, two electron threshold. So 
we have a very large, uh, we, we are developing and we already have a significant, but it's getting larger, the community of uh, experts in this technology, right? In Latin America, in Europe, in US and in Canada. And uh, so we have a, an interesting technology, a large group of, uh, of experts that can build a, a detector, a significant detector of this size. And uh, the price tag is not killing us yet. So uh, we think that there are many science opportunities for this, no? neutrino experiments using radioactive source, neutrino experiments at reactors, low mass uh, wind search, dark sector searches like the ones I showed you before. And if you push uh, a little bit on the mass, you can e even have uh, observation, you will see a few uh, neutrinos from, from supernovas in your detector. So, uh, and this will be a different way of seeing the neutrinos because you will see all the flavors in the same way, so it could be of some interest. So the question is, I mean, we don't need a large, uh, larger uh, volume, right, to, to install our detector. So we, it's not that we need to do Andes for this, right? But uh, there is a, a lot of uh, already participation in different places in, in Latin America, and, uh, and may maybe it could make sense that some of these large mass detectors eventually ends up in, in Andes. It's something to think about uh, in the long term, right? So I have two questions which might be related. Um, so you haven't, what is the main source of background that you have? And then if that affects what is the more problematic, what is the problems to scaling up? And what are the difficulties? Okay, so the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest limitation we have now, uh, so right now we are still limited by the mass, right? But we know that uh, our, our detectors, especially at the very, at the, at the very uh, one or two electrons will be limited by the dark current, okay? The dark current that we had in this uh, observation is 1.1 electrons per pixel per day. We think, so no, well, now we know that we can get a dark current on this same detector operated in a smarter way, two orders of magnitude lower, okay? And we think that the dark current from the silicon is about four orders of magnitude lower. So we, we think that this, this experiment here, uh, this experiment here, right, is with five DRUs of uh, environmental background, right, five DRUs, uh, not so, as you know, not so hard to achieve, and uh, a dark current on, uh, but, but what is really critical is not those DRUs, but the dark current, and the dark current of uh, about 10 to the, 10 to the minus 4 uh, electrons per pixel per day. Okay, so that, but that's the critical parameter, the dark current. And this is also the critical parameter for increasing the, no, the volume? Or what no, is the, the critical parameter for increasing, I mean, <laughs> this is one gram, right? The, this is less than one gram. So to, r to achieve... Uh, 40 uh, kilograms, right, or let me show you. I had some pictures somewhere. Okay, this is how we build our detectors, right? So we take these things and we put one by one. So if we have to put 4,000 of these together, we'll ne never do it, right? I, in, we'll never get there. So we have to scale in a smarter way, and the way we are planning to do it is to use the technology that, wa that was developed for the silicon trackers on CMS, right, and scale in that way. Make our detector look like a CMS detector uh, that has uh, that number of uh, silicon sensors, right? So change the strategy, because what we have been doing is modifying a little bit the developments for astronomy, <laughs> right? So that's why we have this limitation. We have to change the paradigm and go to this, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I have something somewhere. No, I don't have anything. Okay, so yes, go make it look like a CMS tracker 
And we, ha we are working with the CMS people at Fermilab also to, to do this scaling. So put the electro call the electronics next to the detector, make it all digital to the outside, things like that. Thanks. Other question, comment? So, you know, there are two possible scenarios. Either the, uh, you have high mass neutrinos or you have ultralight supersymmetric particles. So either you go to, say, 10 to the minus something <laughs> to, say, uh, typically the 1 JV. So I, I like very much this approach, but what would happen if psi particles are really in the order of supersymmetric? Particles. I mean, so, can you comment on that? Because you, you, you mean ma much more massive than what I was showing? Yeah, no? very much lighter than that. Oh, very much lighter than. Yes. So, I mean, the. So what what uh, we are thinking about is this MEV scale with this technology, right? Yeah. The. For much, much lighter than that, you, you, know, you get to axion-like particles, and that's another technique. But there is a range in between where yeah. the technology is tricky. And uh, thinking about superconductor detectors is maybe the, the way to, to approach that. Uh -huh. but, uh, but I don't think there is a lot of development in that intermediate range yet, right? I Not mean, maybe is. others. Maybe uh, others. No, sure, sure. Maybe others know more, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think the so so you need at least one electron volt to get one electron in a, yeah. in silicon. Yeah. So if you want to go to lower mass, then you need different materials. Some people are working to. Right, color centers. Yeah. That has extremely, yes, yeah, that has extremely low, low threshold. So uh, I was saying there is a, p I'm not a part of this project, but it is done in our lab uh, to develop a detector which is based on color centers, which are defects on crystals. And this has really low threshold yeah. for... Right. So, for sure. But yeah, as far as far as I know, for these color centers, it's not going to work in uh, ultra low uh, temperatures, and and so it's just you know not like qubits. It's just measuring the the spectrum, the light spectrum, right? Doing spectrography. Right. That's so it. they they take a crystal, There's they a produce yeah. these defects, and, and actually you want it to be yeah you want to yeah. anneal it if you have some defects right. from whatever, and you want to be able for that. Right. But I mean, somehow it could be that at a certain point, I mean, you may start developing ideas, especially if you are moving to a sector of very light. Yeah. Yeah, so there is a region that is very complicated, right? The, uh, w when you go to, to the extremely low mass for action light particles, there's a big industry there already. And then there is these efforts and, you know, super CDMS and so on that are pushing to, to MEV. But there is still a hole there that eventually, you know, things like, like color centers, hopefully, you know. Can but, uh, but yeah, my guess for that is that, uh, you know, this is really preliminary yeah. R&D for that. So this is something that probably won't, won't see, won't take real data for the next 10 years or so, right? Yeah. Okay. I, well, hopefully before, but you know, <laughs> being realistic. I mean, they are starting now, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have a prototype in our lab yeah. searching for now trying to quantify the correct crystals or whatever, but you know, this is this is quite this, this has quite a lot of uh, effort still to to come for making it operational. Yeah. Okay, well then send Juan again and go for lunch.